Hello everyone, I am the Method Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews out of the deck text. On this episode of The Brewery, I'll be discussing my take on a recently spoiled commander from Strixhaven, Exodus Auric Overlord. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout my video, please consider using the TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description. It'll really help out the channel. The best way you can help support the channel is with my Patreon. For just $1, patrons get early access to certain videos on YouTube. In fact, patrons got a chance to see this video earlier. You can also support my channel for free by simply liking, subscribing, and sharing, which also helps out a lot. You can find all pertinent links down in the description. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Exodus is a 2-4 human warlock with double strike for 1 generic, 1 white, and 2 black. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, you get to recover a non-legendary creature card from your graveyard to your hand. This is an incredibly powerful effect since it's an amazing recursion engine right in the command zone. Even his double strike is going to come in super handy and we'll eventually see why. Now, while the deck is centered around Exodus as a recursion engine, this is a modular double phase card where its backside is Awaken the Blood Avatar, a sorcery for 6 generic, 1 black, and 1 red. It might seem highly costed, but it does have a built-in cost reduction effect where its cost is reduced by 2 for each creature you sacrifice as you're casting it. When it resolves, each opponent sacrifices a creature and you create a 3-6 avatar token with haste that pings all opponents for 3 whenever it attacks. So, while Exodus is a recurgent engine in the command zone, its backside sorcery is a win con in the command zone. Therefore, this deck aims to cast Exodus as early as possible to get the most benefit out of his recursion ability in order to set up a board state that will eventually allow us to cast Awaken the Blood Avatar indefinitely many times in order to create infinitely many hasty 3-6s that will kill the table before the blocker step even occurs. Before we discuss how to win via Awaken the Blood Avatar, let's see the recursion engines of the deck and how Exodus can facilitate that. Let's start simply by making the most out of the non-legendary creatures in the deck by discarding them to pay for spells and effects. Thrill of Possibility, Cathartic Reunion, Tormenting Voice, Wild Guest, Honor the God Pharaoh, Pirate's Pillage, and Seize the Spoils all require discarding cards in order to draw cards, with the last three providing an additional bonus of tokens, treasures, and sacrifice fodder. With the way Exodus works and the timing of these spells, we can actually recover the card discarded to them if it was a non-legendary creature. This is how it works. In order to cast a spell, you have to discard a card. In this case, we discard a non-legendary creature. Then, the spell enters the stack, triggering Exodus. Since the creature is already in the graveyard by the time Exodus' trigger enters the stack, we can target that same creature discarded to the spell's additional cost and return it to our hand. So we're essentially keeping that creature card after casting the loot spell, as well as drawing the cards that it gives us with the exception being Cathartic Reunion, which requires discarding two cards to cast. We don't have to recover the same creature card discarded to these spells though. We can use Exodus' trigger to recover any legendary creature card from our graveyard, but it's good to know that we can still make the absolute most of these types of spells. Deal Broker, Angie Falconrath, and Remaging Goblin don't trigger Magecraft, but you can still loot to draw cards. They don't require mana to tap down and can be used to accelerate further into the deck. There are creatures which also allows them for them to be sacrificed in a pinch as well or even be used as chum blockers. So while they're not as good as the previous looting spells, they're almost as good. Zephyr Boots, Mask of Memory, and Azra Oddsmaker take advantage of Exodus' built-in double strike as I mentioned in the beginning of the video. Since these trigger on combat damage, they'll trigger twice thanks to Exodus having double strike. The boots in particular give Exodus evasion making it easier to hit an opponent. The best of these is the Azra since it requires only one card to be discarded and if Exodus connects both times, we draw four cards from it, all while paying zero mana. Further along in the video, you'll see other ways to make Exodus more dangerous to make the most out of our attacking with him, if it comes down to that. Bone Miser and Surly Bajasart make the most out of all the cards we're discarding while playing this deck. The Miser creates a 2-2 zombie whenever we discard a creature, two black mana in our mana pool whenever we discard a land, and we draw a card whenever we discard any other card type, whereas the dinosaur gets bigger when we discard a creature, creature creates treasure tokens when we discard a land, and fights a creature we don't control whenever we discard any other card type, which is decent removal. So these creatures do some serious work in this deck. Street Wraith and Hollow One are easily recurrable ways to draw a card thanks to them having cycling. Out of all of the possible creatures of cycling that can go in the deck, I chose these two because the Wraith doesn't require mana to cycle, and the Golem can be cast for free if we've already discarded 3 cards beforehand, so it's a free chump blocker, sacrifice fodder, etc. in a pinch. But these are used mainly to cycle away and then recover later with Exodus's Magecraft trigger. Ranger Captain of Eos doesn't provide card advantage in the sense of strictly drawing us cards, but it does tutor for a 1 drop when it enters the battlefield. However, more importantly than that, it can be sacrificed for free at instant speed to prevent an opponent from casting non-creature spells that turn. So we can sacrifice this before we go off to protect our combos from counter magic, or we can sacrifice it during a combo player's upkeep to prevent them from comboing off. Then we can just recur with Exodus. 
The ranger isn't the only creature like this in the deck and we're going to see more of them soon, but this one can also tutor for a 1 drop which is why I mention it here. Quark the Thumbless is another card I want to mention while we're discussing card advantage recursion. Quark is just insanely good in this deck. Unfortunately, it can't be recovered with Exus, but that's not that big of an issue. In this deck, Quark is win-win. If you lose the flip, the spells return to your hand and you don't get its effect. However, it was still cast, so it triggers Magecraft and other triggers that care about casting instants, sorceries, or non-creature spells. If you do win the flip, then the spell is copied, so not only will it trigger Magecraft twice, but you'll also double the spell's effects when it resolves. Amazing card here. Finally, Thought Vessel and Reliquary Tower are included because we do draw a ton of cards with this deck and we don't want to be discarding more than what we need. Either way, Thought Vessel is a decent enough rock in a non-green deck since it only costs 2 to cast and enters the battlefield untapped. When I discussed Ranger Captain of Eos, I had mentioned that it wasn't the only value creature in the deck. So now let's look at those creatures and how we can abuse recurring them. Rubble Belt Maka, Splendor Mare, and Void Beckoner are the creatures that I mentioned that can make Exus even more dangerous in combat, whether we are attacking or blocking. The Maka and Beckoner in particular are amazing combat tricks since they can be used in response to a block. Giving Exus a death touch counter at instant speed is amazing since he has double strike. That way he deals lethal damage first without taking any damage himself. Oh, and you get to draw a card from cycling it away. The Maka giving him plus 3 plus 3 is also amazing since that's a total of up to 6 additional damage you could be dealing thanks to double strike. Granted, once you do this the first time as a surprise, if opponents are keeping track and paying attention, then it won't be that big of a surprise when you're recurring these creatures back to your hand. That being said, they do still put opponents into a tough position when it comes to making decisions since they know you have the option to use them all over again. Sufa Boots and Champion's Helm are also included in the deck so I might as well mention them here. The reason I'm using equipments that give Hexproof is because then otherwise we won't be able to target Exus with our positive effects like the ones just mentioned here, as well as the other effects mentioned earlier. So they protect us from opponents' targeted effects while still allowing us to utilize Exus in more ways than one. Going back to responses, Archfiend of Ifnir can also be used to deal with Creature. It works automatically every time we discard a card, so it's brutal against creature-based decks since we can very easily wipe opponents' boards in a single turn, potentially each turn, especially if we discard a lot of cards at instant speed in response to an alpha strike or even just at the end of the turn before ours. It also has cycling itself if you need the card draw in a pinch. Fulminator Mage deals with non-basic lands, so it's pretty obvious how we'll be using it. Being able to recur when needing to blow up multiple utility lands is quite powerful, and it costs the same to cast as any old-school land destruction spell. Augur of Skulls is a great and cheap way to deal with control players. We do have to sacrifice it only during our upkeep, but in the meantime, it's a decent blocker since it has regeneration. Then we sacrifice it in our upkeep and recover it with Exus's Magecraft if we need it back. Fairy Macabre and Remorseful Cleric deal with opponents' graveyards. The Fairy is the best since we can discard it for free and record it later. So it's a 0 mana investment. Even so, the Cleric isn't that expensive at 2 mana, plus it's a 2 1 flyer, so it has amazing stats. If we're facing any graveyard strategy decks, it's definitely a wrench of their plan. And if not, it's still a 2-1 flyer for 2, which is useful in and of itself. Children of Corliss and Bartered Cow help us gain life with the children almost being a fog effect on a body while the cow creates food. The Ranger Captain can tutor for the children, so it's amazing to help us survive any damage and or life loss that won't kill us on the spot. The cow is also amazing because we get the food token for free when it's discarded. Life gain might not seem that crucial, but we don't have any huge creatures so we might be on the receiving end of a beating, so these creatures do their work of buffering that. Besides, soon you'll see another reason why all these food tokens are incredibly useful. Now that we've seen most of what we want to be recurring and how to make the most of them, let's see how to make the most of the mage craft triggers, spells with buyback. Alley, Shattering Pulse, and Slaughter are removal spells that might seem overcosted if you're always paying the buyback cost, but you can always just ignore it if you're in a pinch. That being said, you can always consider the buyback cost as the cost of getting a non-legendary creature back to your hand along with the spell itself. It's just too powerful a mechanic in this deck. Slaughter is even better since its buyback is life and not mana. And as we saw earlier, the life loss isn't such an issue in this deck. Demonic Collusion is another similar spell since its buyback cost is mana free. In fact, it's even better since we have to discard cards. Since discarding the card is a part of the additional cost, we have the potential of recovering any legendary creatures discarded to it with Exodus. Even though there are much better tutors than this in general, Demonic Collusion does some epic work in this deck. You get your combo pieces and the next change to your hand is zero. Worthy Cause is relatively cheap even taking the buyback cost into consideration. Worthy Cause has to sacrifice a creature as part of its cost which means we always need something to sacrifice to gain life but it also means we're able to send something to the graveyard to be recurred. Since the sacrifice is part of its cost, you need to see the oracle wording, you'd be able to recur the very same creature sacrificed with Exodus Magecraft ability. So this is a part of a very useful engine we're going to be seeing soon. Recruit the Worthy is another good and cheap buyback spell we can use to abuse Magecraft triggers. 
To consistently get a 1-1 one, one requires paying 4 mana, but it's an instant which is a plus. In any case, we'll always have a creature for chump blocking, sacrifice fodder, etc. Haze of Rage and Seething Anger are some more combat tricks for Exodus that can be bought back. Haze of Rage is the best one since it also has Storm, so this spell alone will trigger Magecraft a ton of times. So always try and buy back it so you always have it available. Believe it or not, it is possible to win with combat in grindier games since Exodus has double strike and we're getting rid of other creatures. Shattering Spirit is also included even though it doesn't have buyback but it has Replicate. So if we sink enough red mana into it, we can destroy quite a lot of artifacts, but it'll also trigger Magecraft that many times since it's getting copied for each red mana we paid. Tendrils of Agony is the other storm card in the deck because it'll trigger Magecraft multiple times just on its own and it's just a great way to potentially get rid of an opponent while also gaining us life. It's also a good plan B to have for when we've assembled an engine but aren't really able to get the win. As to this engine I keep mentioning, let's see the culmination of all the synergy. Sir Conrad the Grim pings all opponents each time a creature hits our graveyard from anywhere, so any creature we keep discarding or any creature we keep sacrificing will definitely add up. And if we're doing it infinitely many times, then we win right then and there. Professor Onyx also hits all opponents by draining them for two which each mage craft trigger. Granted this triggered ability is the main reason she's in the deck, but her loyalty abilities are quite useful as well. But again, she's mostly here for her Magecraft ability. Sedgemore Witch and Young Pyromancer create tokens with their synergistic triggers. The Witch is slightly better than the Pyromancer since she'll also trigger when a spell is copied, so the Witch is way more important as far as engine parts go. In any case, the Pyromancer gives us Cannon Fodder and Sacrifice Fodder, which isn't a bad thing. Stormkiln Arnest and Briggy Guard of Storytelling gives us mana with their triggers. While the Dwarf only creates tokens via Magecraft, Briggy generates red mana with every spell we cast regardless of type. While her backside is useful, we're only ever casting her as Birgi in this deck. Hopefully you can already envision the engine being assembled, because we're almost there. One other crucial piece is Dockside Extortionist. With some engine pieces in place, if it creates at least two treasures when it enters the battlefield, we're golden. Let's see an interaction with what it can do in the very minimum. If we have Exus, Birgi, and Stormkiln Artist already in play, with Dockside Extortionist at worthy cost in our hand, this is enough to get infinite Magecraft triggers. We just need enough mana to cast Dockside Extortionist to start. So we cast it, triggering Burgi and getting us 1 red mana in our mana pool. If it creates at least 2 treasures when it enters, we can continue with no net gain in mana. If it creates more than 2, this will also give us infinite mana. Anyways, let's assume the minimum for the moment. We crack the 2 treasures and use the red mana to cast Worthy Cause with buyback, sacrificing Dockside Extortionist as part of his casting cost. This triggers Burgi, getting us 1 red mana. It triggers the Dwarf, getting us a treasure. And it triggers Excess, returning Dockside Extortionist to our hand. We can recast it with the red mana and the treasure in order to start all over again. If we have Professor Onyx in play, infinitely casting Worthy Cause gives us the win. Or, with Sir Conrad, we also get the win with the Goblin's Death Triggers. However, if Dockside Extortionist creates more than two treasures, we end up with infinite treasure tokens afterwards. We can then use some of that infinite mana to cast Worthy Cause, sacrificing Excess to it. Then use the rest of the infinite mana to cast Awaken the Blood Avatar infinitely many times creating infinitely many hasty blood avatar tokens that hit opponents for 3 when attacking. However, these aren't the only game-ending configurations for these engines. Phyrexian Altar and Ashen's Altar can help in sacrificing a creature for mana, so a free creature like Hollow One can be sacrificed for mana, recur to our hand with Exodus, cast for free again, etc. This might not create infinite mana on its own, but it can be used for advantage. For example, with Young Pyromancer we create a token we can sacrifice each time we cast a spell, maybe with Flashback. With Virgi, we also get mana with Stormkiln Artist treasures which can add up to form an infinite mana engine between them. We can also sacrifice Dockside Extortionist to either alter if it'll only create one treasure when it enters the battlefield. So whether as part of an infinite combo or epic engine, these alters do work. As for the other engines we can build, remember Sedgemorge Witch from earlier? It's also part of an infinite engine. With Sedgemorge Witch and any other creature on the battlefield, we just need enough mana to cast Chain Plasma once. The first time we cast it, it has to target the extra creature in order to be cast. However, that's going to trigger the Witch, creating a pest. When Chain Plasma resolves, we can then discard a card to copy Chain Plasma targeting the new pest and triggering the Witch, creating another pest. This makes infinite death triggers and infinite magecraft triggers, so with either Professor Onyx and or Sir Conrad on the battlefield, that's enough for the win. Speaking of chains, Chain of Smog is also included here since it goes infinite with Professor Onyx, all on its own as part of a 2 card infinite combo. Either way, we can also use it with Stormkiln Artist to create infinite treasure tokens. We can then sacrifice them to cast Awaken the Blood Avatar infinitely many times from the command zone for the win. We can also abuse it with Sedgemore Witch to create infinitely many pests that can be used to attack the entire table or sacrifice to Phyrexian Altar for infinite mana. So it has more uses than simply comboing with Liliana. Oh, before I forget, 
Creating infinite treasure tokens or infinite food tokens with Bartered Cow makes Stormkill and Arnis have infinite power, making it one-shot anyone it hits. Don't forget that when you're assembling your board state. You can also generate infinite mana with Lion's Eye Diamond and Oriok Salvagers or Lion's Eye Diamond with Underworld Breach if you want a more competitive build. You can add these along with a lot of stacks effects to slow down the table while assembling your combo as well as more tutors for consistency. So this does have the potential to be a monster of a deck, but I decided to make it a bit more casual than competitive. Some more interactions include recurring cards like Burnished Heart in order to try and get mana acceleration via some land-based ramp. This robot L can be recurred to our hand with Exus so we can use this to try and get ahead in mana outside of green. Igneous Pouncer doesn't put the land onto the battlefield but it can be land cycled away for a mountain or swamp which doesn't necessarily have to be a basic land, so we can get a Triome or any dual type land in the deck. This still triggers other things that care about getting cycled or discarded so keep that in mind as well. At least it'll be difficult to miss our land drops for just 2 mana. Smothering Tithe is another way we get treasures. It's a no brainer considering the deck isn't running green. The deck isn't running any wheels, but it's still going to get us treasures more often than not. Jeweled Lotus and Dark Ritual are other no-brainers, perhaps the Ritual more so than the Lotus since it triggers way more things than the Lotus does. Each of these allows us to cast an early Exus with the Lotus giving us the possibility of a turn 1 Exus if we drop a land that can tap for white. Soul Ring, Mana Crypt, Arcane Signet, Boros Signet, Orzhov Signet, and Rakdo Signet are the standard mana rocks included in the deck. Their inclusion is pretty self-explanatory since this isn't a green deck. Granted, we can run other white cards that can fetch for our planes when they enter the battlefield, but most of them are situational and a bit too expensive to recast later on when sacrificed and then recurred with Exodus. It just has too many hoops to jump through and too expensive to pull off. Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth and Cabal Coffers have the potential of generating a ton of black mana which can provide for some explosive turns especially if we're able to assemble a land cycling engine that'll help us get a land drop per turn. Speaking of lands, the rest of the deck is just the rest of the lands. The deck's running all 10 fetch lands, all 3 dual lands, all 3 shock lands, survive triome, command tower, tainted peak, tainted field, mana confluence, city of brass, and ancient tomb, as well as 3 of each snow covered basic lands in case anyone's running anything that benefits us for it. As always, if you're not playing online or don't already have them, the dual lands, fetch lands, cabal coffers, and mana crypts are not entirely necessary for the deck to run, and you can just as easily swap them out for any budget substitutes and the deck will still run well enough or you can just proxy them if that's fine with your playgroup. This brew is just an idea of how to build around Exus Auric Overlord. This deck is a lot of fun to pilot because it's not super linear and the synergy overlaps, meaning that it's like a puzzle figuring out which pieces go where to assemble the many different engines the deck is capable of building. Naturally, for lack of time, I did not mention absolutely every route to victory, but I mentioned the base cards for which you can also build upon as you're playing the deck. Thanks to Exus, you can win once you have infinite mana, but you can also win other ways even without infinite mana. And for more grindier games, you can also just slowly but surely win all Wars of Attrition to be the last player standing. If you're interested in the decklist of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link. That also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of The Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I'm the Bennett Kirby, and happy brewing.